Some men say the earth is flat, and some men say it is round. But if it is flat, could Parliament make it round? And if it is round, could the king's command flatten it? Now, this was St. Thomas More arguing as his own lawyer, representing himself in his trial for, purge, for uh, treason, the alleged, and under the laws of England at the time, the proven act of treason, was Thomas More's refusal to acknowledge that Henry VIII, of all people, was the head of the Roman Catholic Church in England. For that refusal to say yes to that command, he was charged, tried, convicted, and of course executed. His head was separated from the rest of his body. Now, when he's making this argument to the jury, of course the parliament couldn't make a round earth flat, and of course the king couldn't make a flat earth round. He's not only appealing to the common sense of his jurors, he's appealing to their understanding of the natural law, their understanding of the order of things, their understanding of immutable laws that regulate and control even the king, even the government, even the parliament. It was his way of articulating, shortly before his execution, what Aristotle and Augustine and Aquinas had articulated, what, Jefferson, what John Locke and Thomas Jefferson would articulate. Jefferson's articulation of it is a little bit more familiar to us because he wrote the words uh, in the Declaration of Independence, and we know these words from our childhood that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, when Jefferson wrote this, and when the, the, the founding fathers who led the war of secession from Great Britain, when's the last time your public school teacher referred to it as that, the war of secession from Great Britain, which of course is what it was, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. If they had lost the War of Secession, which we call the American Revolution, they would have been hanged as traitors. But they won, and they are celebrated as founding fathers. But when they signed this document, knowing what it said, in those days they read things before they voted for them and signed them. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike today. They were wedding. They were wedding to the United States of America at its birth, the concept of the natural law. And, and the simple modern articulation of that is this. Our rights come from our humanity and not from the government. And that articulation formed the basis, at least in theory, of the war of secession against Great Britain and of the earliest parts uh, of our existence as a country. Now, whether you believe that we are the highest and best creatures of nature, or whether you believe, as I do, that we're, we were created by an all-knowing, all-loving God who has counted the hairs on our heads, in either case, you can accept the argument that we are sovereign human beings. If we are the highest form of nature at this point in the history of existence, we are sovereign human beings. And because we are sovereign human beings and the government is a temporary organization based on fire and force, the individual is greater than the government. If we are creatures of an almighty, all-knowing, all-loving God created in his image and likeness, then the one aspect that we absolutely share with him, we don't share everything because we have human bodies and he doesn't, talking about God the Father, but the one aspect that we truly share with him is freedom integral to our existence. As he is perfectly free, we are perfectly free. Now, the landscape of, of history is littered with people abusing their freedom. It's a testimony to the misuse and abuse of freedom, but it's also a testament to the existence and perfection of human freedom. We are free to do as we wish because that is the essence of our existence. So if the government tries to exalt itself above that freedom, it's not only getting in our face in a way we don't like, it's violating the laws of nature. Because whether you call it nature or him, God the Father, nature and God are superior to the government, and they have created us with this freedom. In 1787, when the Constitution was being written in secret uh, in Philadelphia, the scrivener was James Madison. He kept the notes. We've since seen the notes. Many of his notes were eventually uh, engrafted into language of the Constitution. 
Um, the first argument we know from his notes was, where does our freedom come from? Now, Madison said, this is not an argument that we should engage in. Do you remember what many of us signed 14 years ago? It was the Declaration of Independence. We already stated where our freedom comes from. Well, the world was different then. The king was gone. The British troops were gone. They'd come back in the War of 1812, but at the time in 1787, they were gone. So this argument did exist in secret in Philadelphia. Madison made the Jeffersonian argument. I know Jefferson wasn't there. He was still the U.S. ambassador to France. He was in Paris at the time. But his argument was, much as Jefferson made, much as Moore made, our rights come from our humanity. Governments are instituted by our consent, with our limitations, to protect that freedom. There was a big government crowd at Philadelphia, personified typically by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. And they argued that because you need the government to protect our freedom, because the government's resources are limited, the government can decide what freedoms to protect and what freedoms to restrict. And therefore, while strictly speaking, freedoms don't come from the government, they are subject to the approval of the government. This argument, which lawyers call positivism, which basically means the law of the land is whatever the lawgiver says it is, so it was adopted by all the great nefarious uh, dictators and monsters of the 20th century, it's even been adopted by the monsters who dominate the Congress and the executive branch today, and has been for a while. But it is exactly the opposite of the natural law. When Aquinas uh, articulated the natural law, he said that an unjust law is no law, and that a law that violates the laws of nature, one that, for example, silenced speech because the government didn't like the speech, is a law that is not worthy of being obeyed, and that no one has an obligation of obeying an unjust law.